Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Give it uh, one second. So I see a Tarek, David, Sarke, Perna. I guess we're really just waiting on Grace. Is that right? I think so. Everybody have a nice weekend. Mm -hmm. All right, yes. Yes. <laughs> How about you, Dr. Bass? What's that? How about you? I was all right. The rain put a little damper on it, but I was happy because our cases from Friday all went well and everybody looked good on Saturday. So that was the, that was definitely the highlight. <laughs> That's always nice. It could always be that way. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, it's a somewhat shortened case, shortened one, but uh, let's see here. I guess it's seven o'clock. So, and I see Dr. Kong is with us, so we can get going. All right, uh, keeping up with our drug perusal. We did this last year, but we'll do it again. Is the class 1A agents, which are sodium channel blocking agents. And again, they are uh, quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide. And these agents block the rapid sodium channel, slowing the upstroke of the action potential, as well as the potassium channel. So they can prolong the duration of the action potential and prolong refractoriness. And so if this is the usual um, curve of the action potential of the heart, we see the, uh, the dotted line represents the impact of these medications. And of these three agents, really in present era, procainamide is the only one that we use with any regularity. But we're going to go through all three because uh, it is possible somebody may one day ask you the question about the other two, particularly when you're taking your board examinations. <laughs> So quinidine, quinidine is uh, an old agent that is absorbed 80 to 90% from the GI tract. So very good uh, bioavailability. And quinidine is eliminated by the liver. So patients with liver disease needs to be adjusted appropriately. Half-life is about five to eight hours. And like all of the 1A agents, it is mostly a sodium channel blocking agent, but also blocks potassium channels. And I think most of the effects of the potassium channel is the metabolite of the medication. Um, hemodynamically, it blocks alpha adrenergic receptors causing peripheral vasodilation and reflex tachycardia. Um, and it also has a vagolytic effect and may improve AV conduction. And for that reason, whenever one prescribes quinidine, it's routine to prescribe another agent to block the AV node or to slow AV nodal conduction, things like um, propranolol or tenolol or metolol, or perhaps even a calcium channel blocker, uh, particularly when you're treating a significant atrial arrhythmia. And, uh, but it doesn't have any negative inotropic effects of significance. Um, quinidine used to be used more commonly. Mostly we don't use it today because it has a lot of side effects, but it was actually a very effective anti, was and is an effective uh, antiarrhythmic. Um, it was very good for uh, accessory pathway mediated tachycardias as well as AVNRT. Um, and in patients who have Rugata syndrome, who have a lot of uh, particularly SVT, which is seen in some patients with Brugada syndrome. Um, this is actually a uh, very helpful agent, and um, it's not uncommon to have Brugada patients, although we're most concerned about ventricular arrhythmias. They are at increased risk for atrial and SVT types of arrhythmias, and uh, some of these patients are better with quinidine, not uncommon. So that's probably, I would say, in the present year of 2021, the most common use for quinidine is patients who have Brugada syndrome. Again, it is not a first-line agent. We actually don't have any agents that are specifically tailored for Brugada syndrome, but uh, quinidine is uh, the only agent that has been shown to be somewhat effective in that setting. Um, now, the reason, as I said earlier, that we don't use this medication very often is because it has a very high side effect profile. And the most common are GI symptoms, a lot of diarrhea associated with it. Um, like any antiarrhythmic agent, it can be prorhythmic. And then finally, 
uh, quinidine uh, can result in a so-called synchronism, which are all these neurological findings, particularly tinnitus, visual blurriness, and hearing disturbances. When I took my boards uh, now uh, almost 25 years ago, tinnitus and quinidine was a very common association one needed to know for the boards. I don't think they probably ask that any longer. I don't know. But uh, even when I was a fellow, though, we were not ever prescribing quinidine. In fact, I think I only have a single patient who's on quinidine who has Brugada syndrome. So uh, just remember, this is a very important uh, association of tinnitus, visual blurring, and hearing disturbances, particularly tinnitus with quinidine. Okay. In terms of drug interactions, it can potentiate warfarin effect, meaning that you need to lower the dose. It also can increase digoxin levels. So if you're using digoxin as your AV nodal blocking agent, you have to be careful with that. Um, and the following agents can lower levels of quinidine, phenobarbital, rifampin, and phenytoin. Um, uh, and that's because of the cytochrome P450 system that's being revved up by these agents. Um, so one needs to adjust or measure quinidine levels in that. And levels are higher when you're giving amiodarone at the same time. I have never given the combination of quinidine with amiodarone. I would imagine patients probably got a very bad arrhythmia if you're on both of those at the same time, um, but the level has to be adjusted. Okay, uh, procainamide the second of the uh, so-called 1A agents. Procainamide is also very easily absorbable from the GI tract, 70 to 90%. And um, it is uh, metabolized in the liver to NAPA, which is the metabolite of procainamide. And NAPA is actually a class three metabolite. So procainamide like quinidine is both a class 1A as well as having class three effects from the metabolite. Um, and NAPA is excreted by the kidneys. And so in the past, when we would uh, put people on procainamide for long periods of time, because we didn't have as much familiarity with other IV agents, and didn't have as many, particularly amio, it was very common that we would get procainamide levels, but we would also get NAPA levels uh, in order to know that we were not toxic. In the present era, you've noticed that we virtually never get proc levels. And that's usually because we don't generally use procainamide for one or two days and in most hospitals, that is now a send out test. And so by the time you get the results back, it's likely you will no longer be on the agent. And that's probably the most common reason that I've never asked you to send a uh, proc level. Um, and NAPA is excreted by the kidneys. So it's important to remember that you need both liver and kidney function to properly metabolize procainamide. The half-life is short at three to five hours. And again, it's a sodium channel blocking agent as well as a potassium channel blocking agent. Um, Procainamide has a number of hemodynamic effects. Um, and this first one is very important, which is it blocks alpha adrenergic receptors similar to quinidine. And this again causes peripheral vasodilation and reflex tachycardia. Um, and if, uh, if a patient is hypotensive during the infusion, uh, the key is to slow down the infusion rate. Um, and the other thing, of course, is to have volume available to help with the, the hypotension that can sometimes be associated with PROC. You know, we're going to go over the dosing in a moment. The dosing of um, procainamide is generally, if you look in a book, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 milligrams per kilo as a bolus. Um, but <clears throat> what I learned actually by talking to Lizzie DeWitt, who is a, a junior staff member in the EP division at uh, Boston Children's is that where they use a tremendous amount of procainamide is that their general approach is to give five milligrams per kilo, uh, look for a fact, and then give just keep giving more in five milligram per kilo aliquots. And with that approach, they have not encountered the hypotension. And that's sort of how I've changed in the last a uh, few years, and some of you who've been on with me, we've been treating uh, junction ectopic tachycardia probably have seen that we've done that. And it's not uncommon that you do need to give three five per kilo boluses, but by giving it uh, slowly, typically we give five per kilo over like 20 minutes, we have not encountered much hypotension. It's important to remember that PROC is not a direct negative inotrope. Uh, the reason you're getting hypotensive again is from the alpha adrenergic blockade but not from direct uh, negative inotropy of the agent. And in fact, um, Lizzie 
wrote this nice paper, which I reviewed in my podcast uh, three years ago, showing that at least on the bench, um, uh, procainamide was the least negative inotropic agent of all antiarrhythmic agents. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on what is the, of all the IV agents we have, what is the most negative inotropic, which is like the worst uh, in terms of effect on ventricular function, would you think? Sonny, what do you think? Any thoughts? Uh, Esmolo? No, actually, um, it's amiodarone, which I found very surprising because the theoretical benefit of amio has always been that it has very little inotropic effect, but actually it is, that's not true. Um, at least I thought my belief was wrong. Um, amio has one of the most important negative inotropic effects of all uh, IV antiarrhythmic agents. Esmolol, I'm sure is also a negative inotrope, but the worst is by far amio. Well, it doesn't mean I wouldn't use amio if needed, but one needs to be aware of these uh, issues. All right, uh, clinically, when do we use PROC? It's good for both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. For atrial reentry, it's a commonly used agent. It often will prolong the cycle length of the tachycardia and sometimes even break it. Uh, for uh, orthodromic reentry and tachycardia, it's an excellent agent because of its uh, direct effects on accessory pathway conduction, generally causes accessory pathways to conduct less well and can terminate tachycardia in that mechanism. And then of course, uh, certain forms of ventricular tachycardia are very sensitive to procainamide. Um, and it is an excellent agent for that. And so, you know, we now in the present era, seems like we always reach for amiodarone, but PROC is a very effective agent as well, um, particularly for a VT. And um, again, we've talked about this. We spoke about it as recently as a week or two ago. It is the drug of choice for treating atrial arrhythmias who have rapid accessory pathway conduction. So we've talked that if uh, one encounters a patient with rapidly conducted AFib, uh, the treatment of choice would be either to give procainamide uh, or alternatively to cardiovert the patient, and then of course, uh, refer for ablation. Side effects, as we talked about, is the most common one is hypotension uh, with IV infusion, and again, slow down the rate, and I often will uh, tell the bedside staff to have volume available when using this agent. Um, it has a significant incidence of GI problems, nausea and vomiting, particularly with the oral administration. Um, very importantly, it can cause agranulocytosis with chronic usage. And in general, procainamide has a lot of uh, a lot of symptoms, particularly this lupus-like syndrome, uh, which is more common when the drug is uh, administered. So you get that malar rash, uh, you can get a granulocytosis, it can even affect renal function over time. Um, and this is, these are some of the reasons why we do not generally use procainamide very much anymore, because there are a lot of things one has to monitor when using it chronically. And the other problem with procainamide is it comes only as a very large dose. Uh, because of its short half-life, um, it's really practically a Q6 agent, which is very challenging for any family to use. And so there is a, uh, a long-acting version, which is a BID version, but it comes in such a large dose, like a gram uh, each, uh, each tablet's like a gram, you basically have to be an adult-sized patient. And this is one of the reasons why you don't see us using it as a chronic agent anymore, even though it was very commonly used in the past. Um, it can, uh, the levels of procainamide can be increased by simultaneous administration of amiodarone or trimethoprim. Uh, I have never used the combination of amio and procainamide. I would not recommend it, but uh, if one were, be careful. Um, and drug levels can be decreased with concomitant uh, alcohol consumption. Again, these are not real issues in our pediatric patients usually. And again, of course, I'm sure none of you have ever seen us use this as an oral agent. It's very uncommon. In the past, the most common reason people would use procainamide were patients with WPW who had rapidly conducted a pathway. So before the advent of ablation, which I'll remind you really only came about in the early 1990s. So ablation is not a very old intervention. Um, what would typically happen if you had a patient with uh, rapid conduction is you would take the patient to the cath lab, 
you would assess the pathway, uh, then you would give a dose of IV procainamide, and then they would repeat assessment of the pathway in order to see if the administration of amio prolonged the uh, Wanky-Bach or the rapid conduction characteristics of the pathway, making the patient safe. And then the patient would be sent home on procainamide orally. And sometimes they would even repeat the testing after you were on a chronic dose of pro. Um, so that was how this was managed in the past, uh, but obviously today we don't. And today we would more likely use something like flecainide for that purpose if we could not proceed with ablation for some reason, as flecainide uh, will similarly prolong the ELP, although PROC is a more traditional agent for that and more reliable in that regard. Some patients with PROC will even lose pre-excitation with an administration of the drug. That's usually a very good sign that, you, uh, that it's effective in terms of preventing sudden cardiac death. All right, and then the last of the 1A agents is uh, disopyramide. Um, this is uh, an agent that is very dissimilar to quinidine and procainamide chemically, but it has similar electrophysiologic effects. And for this reason, it's included in the uh, 1A classification. It is essentially not used almost at all anymore clinically. Um, Probably the, it, and the reason for that, it has very important negative inotropy. And it's that side effect of disopyramide, which uh, explains the one indication that is still remains for the use of this agent. Does anybody know what uh, disopyramide is used for today, if at all? Okay. A lot of silence, little crickets. It's used, uh, yes, ooh, I see David came in there. Um, maybe like CPVT. CPVT, hmm. what's your thought on that? Why would you think that would be? Because if it's catecholamine sensitive, then maybe uh, something that has this negative inotropy. Well, um, I don't think the negative inotropy is through catechol mediation. <laughs> Uh, but it's a good thought. No, it's actually um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with obstruction. Um, you've probably seen that Dr. Glass and Dr. Lamour will sometimes put their hypertrophs on either beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, uh, particularly those who have obstruction, because by lowering the inotropy, particularly in a hyperdynamic uh, young hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient, using agents like that can sometimes reduce the gradient by reducing inotropy. But actually the most effective agent for that is disopyramide. And there are rarely you will see patients who are on this agent for that reason. It's unusual in the present era, but every once in a while, you'll maybe encounter somebody who was started on it 10 or 20 years ago, might be an ACHD patient who has been on it for many, many years with good effect. I don't think we generally use it very much at all anymore. Um, and uh, the reason for that is it has a lot of anticholinergic effects, uh, dry mouth, eyes, throat in a very high percentage, 40%. And um, it can precipitate closed angle uh, glaucoma. That glaucoma association was always also an important question on the boards in the past. I doubt it would be asked today, but I don't know why it was so important at that time, because we never, in my entire career, we've, I've only seen like two patients ever on disopyramide. But um, if you worked in a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic, uh, you might see a few more of these patients. Okay, and that concludes our discussion of uh, 1A agents. So I was looking through some old EKG strips. This was a rhythm strip that was obtained in a patient following a cath lab closure of an ASD. And uh, the question I have is, uh, what do you think about this? And uh, what would you do about this? And I think I'm going to ask Dr. Condon, who did such a nice job this past weekend taking care of all our inpatients. What do you think about this, Tulsi? And what would you, uh, what do you think? Uh, good morning. Um, so. This is what the nurse hands you. You're going as the good fellow the next day <laughs> to see the patient and the nurse says, well, everything's been fine. Uh, we've been seeing a little bit of this and she rips this off the monitor and hands it to you. So there's definitely um, 
when there is um, a rhythm, so like kind of the right, <laughs> the right side, there's, it looks like there's a, a, a missed beat or there's like a missed QRS complex. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so is this tachycardia or uh, bradycardia or normal? How, I forget if you mentioned how old this person is. I didn't mention it, but I'll say, let's say the patient is five. Five, um, so. Uh, um, looks. Um, you can also say normal if you want. I think it's normal. Yeah, I agree with that. The yeah. overall heart rate is in a normal range. Yeah. Uh, but what do you make of the rhythm? So the rhythm, um, it looks like there's, um, yeah, there's definitely like a missed beat in there. And then um, it looks You're like- You're referring maybe, to this P wave, I assume. Yes, exactly. I don't see a QRS after that. So what do you, what would you call this rhythm where the PR seems to be changing and um, that there is a dropped beat? That's like a type two, it looks like wanky bug. Right, wanky bug, which would be Mobitz type one, right? Oh, right. Okay. Gotcha. This is a uh, wanky buck, right? The PR interval seems to be to the eyeball lengthening until there is a drop P wave. And Tulsi, when someone has uh, has wanky buck or type one, Mobitz type one, second degree heart block, uh, mm -hmm. where is where do we generally believe the injury is when you see that or the, the problem? Is it at the level of the AV node? or is it at the level of the Hispurkinji system? This is not always true, but this is a mostly true you know, question I'm asked. Um, I think the AV node. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Generally speaking, uh, Wanky Bach, remember, is suprahissian or at the level of the AV node. And uh, Mobitz II is generally thought to be at the level of the Hispurkinji system. So um, the patient is wanky balking here and uh, the patient had an ASD closure. Is there any reason to be concerned about this observation or finding? Um, probably because I don't, I don't really know how the, the ASD closure in the cat lab works or in general, but um, well, are, Are there any uh, AV nodal or his structures that might be near an ASD? Um, probably. Okay, that's uh, that's reasonable. <laughs> so, um, where um, where is the AV node sit in the heart? Um, There's a specific triangle. Oh, yes, the Coke triangle or triangle of Coke. Is that what it's called? That's right. The triangle of Coke is where the AV node normally sits. And since you so nicely identified that, maybe you could share with us what the borders of the triangle of Coke are. Oh, we went over this. We had a really nice cat, uh, not cath lab, the uh, pathology lab session. So, um, I, it's like there's the tendon of Totoro is one. And that's the hardest one to remember. <laughs> Very impressed, yes. Um, Totoro, the, yeah. The septal leaflet of um, the... Yes, yes, getting it right. Tricuspid valve. Yes, very good. <laughs> and then the os of the... Uh, one of the osses, right? Yes, it's the <laughs> os of uh, something that drains the coronary. Oh, so the coronary sinus os. Right. See, I knew you went to MIT. <laughs> okay. So um, that's right. So generally speaking, the uh, AV node is located uh, between the tendon of Tartaro, the mouth of the coronary sinus, and the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve in the so-called triangle of Coke. Mm -hmm. And... ASD devices, by definition, are sitting all over that area, mm, right? Yeah. So um, the question is, you come and you see this patient in the morning, and um, 
what would you uh, would you be concerned about this? I I would imagine that there's some um, like perturbation of that area with like or like whatever manipulation is done to to close the ASD. What I don't know is whether that resolves on its own or whether you have to do something about it. Right. So it's so the you're right. It well, I guess what I would say is it's possible for this to happen from an ASD closure. It is not, however, considered a normal observation after ASD closure. Got it. So um, now, if this strip happened to have been obtained at uh, two in the morning mm -hmm. when the child was sleeping, we might be willing to pass it off as just typical wanky bock at night. But if this is happening when the patient is awake, uh, it's an interesting question as to what you should do, because there is no question in that case that the device might be sitting on the node and causing this. And generally speaking, when you have large ASDs that you're closing with a device in the lab, this is a risk because, uh, you know, I have generally said that I don't personally like to close very, very large ASDs in the lab because intuitively it just seems to me like it might not be a good idea to have a piece of Brillo pad be 96% of one's atrial septa. But in truth, that's been shown to be false. Lots of people do that and the patients do very well with large ASD devices. However, this is a real risk, which is that, you know, as you know, all ASD devices have to grab onto the normal septum that surrounds the ASD. We are always looking at the rims when we're doing echocardiograms on ASDs that we're considering for ASD closure in the cath lab. And uh, so, if the defect is fairly large, or if it's quite inferior towards the crux of the heart, there is always this risk um, that you can have this. Uh, I remember well, a number of years ago, I put a, an Amplatzer device in somebody, and while still attached to the delivery cable, the patient went into first degree heart block. Mm -hmm. And I was um, not sure what I should do. Should I leave the device in place? Um, on the theory that uh, ASD closure with first degree block and avoidance of open heart surgery was better um, than uh, or sh with first degree heart block or should I pull it out and send the patient for surgery on the theory that we should never cause any problems. Uh, so what I did at the time, because at that time ASD devices were very new, was I actually called Ziad Hajazi, who was at the time the guru of the Amplatzer device, he still is. And I was amazingly able to get him on the phone while the device was still attached to the cable. And I asked him what he thought I should do. And he recommended that I release the device on the theory that um, the patient, you know, first degree heart block with an ASD device closure was probably uh, less morbid than doing open heart surgery. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I did do that. I followed his advice. I released the device. And interestingly, the patient on multiple follow-up holters had uh, variances between normal PR and a longish PR, but never had higher degree block than that. And I always wondered if perhaps it somehow accentuated the difference between fast and slow pathway by having pressure there. But when one would see a, a conduction problem like this, it would be a challenging question as to whether you would take the device out or not. Certainly, I would monitor this patient. I would not send a patient like this home for fear that this may be progressive. Because if it were to progress, then for sure the patient would need surgery. So this would be a somewhat concerning finding if you- Did you uh, give anti-inflammatory or steroids in that case or? It's a good question. Uh, no, I did not. I did not because I was thinking that the patient was either going, my plan at the time was to put the device in, release it, observe overnight and see what we had. If it were to progress, yes, that's what I would have done. I would have given steroids as I called the surgeon to ask them to take the patient to surgery to remove the device. Um, but um, I did not in that case. But you're right, we do, for, particularly when we have injury to the AV node related to um, any kind of um, ablation near the AV node, it is common that we will try steroids to see if that will reduce the inflammation and uh, improve conduction. One of the interesting questions 
has always been whether patients who have heart block after surgery, uh, whether there would be any benefit to giving steroids in that setting. I believe there are a number of studies that have shown that that is not actually effective. Um, so it's not done and there are a lot of potential negatives to giving steroids in a post-op patient. Okay, this is a venogram that was done uh, by me prior to pacemaker surgery. And uh, you can see the vein is, uh, is here and I have uh, labeled the vein in three parts, one, two, and three. And so I am going to ask Dr. Zawani uh, if he could tell me what the names are of one, two, and three. I think one is the um, um, left subclavian. Uh, no, that is incorrect. Left subclavian is either one, two, or three, but it is not one. Okay. <laughs> Good guess, though. Good guess. Um, so then, um, let's see. This, by the way, is a uh, clamp that is on top of the skin at the level of the deltopectoral groove. I don't think that's going to help your answer, but I just think that, you know. So I guess then the one would be the axillary joining the tree, which is the subclavian. That is correct. That's right. And now what about number two? Um, I'm referring to this structure here. Um, uh, brachial? Uh, well, it used to be the brachial way down here, but that's actually the cephalic vein. Okay. So the cephalic and the axillary join together to create the uh, subclavian vein. And um, now, um, the way that there, one could insert a pacemaker. So first of all, why do we do a venogram uh, when we do it uh, to Tarek before uh, putting a pacemaker wire in? Um, so to make sure that the, there is a good patency of the pains. Yeah, but in a patient who, that's correct. So certainly somebody who had already had leads in there, you'd want to know that the vein is still patent. But this particular patient you can see does not have any pacemaker system in place. This is a new pacemaker for this patient. Uh, is there any other reason one would do this? Um, I think to check if there is any aneurysms. Mm. No. That would be unusual. Really, the reason we do it is twofold. First of all, we want to rule out the presence of an LSVC. So, because oh. uh, if you have an LSVC, that's going to significantly complicate the pacemaker surgery. Um, in fact, a lot of people would not consider putting pacing leads through the LSVC, which, as you know, normally drains to the coronary sinus, et cetera, it makes the surgery much more challenging and may not be a good idea. The other reason that we do it is because uh, oftentimes when we're, we're perking the vessel, we uh, will use the angiogram to help us identify where it is. Um, now, one could put the pacing wire in any of these, and each one has its benefits. So let me just briefly go through them. So the most common place that operators place pacemaker wires is directly into the subclavian vein. The advantage is it's the largest vein of the three, and it is the easiest to access uh, percutaneously uh, with the needle. Um, the disadvantage, however, is that when you put a lead directly into the subclavian, it risks uh, subclavian crush injury, which is when the muscle and the clavicle will, a clavicular crush will cause a 
chronic injury to the insulation of the lead. And so um, when leads are placed directly into the subclavian vein, on average, they have a lower longevity than leads placed in either the cephalic or the axillary vein. So as a general rule, the farther out you put the lead, the less likely that is going to be a concern. And leads are generally more robust and have a longer longevity when they're implanted in these two veins. Um, the other disadvantage of a subclavian stick is that by definition, you're putting the needle into the chest uh, above the lung. And so the risk for either a pneumothorax or a hemothorax is much higher when you are putting a lead directly into the subclavian. But the rapidity with which you can access the vein, uh, the reliability of doing it uh, is a reason that most, that many operators will go directly into the uh, subclavian. The cephalic vein is sort of the most standard or the old fashioned uh, surgical approach. And so the cephalic vein typically runs in most patients at the deltopectoral groove and there's usually a fat pad as one dissects down that sits right over this vein. And once it's identified, the surgeon can, uh, or the op cardiologist can basically make an incision uh, into the vein and actually directly insert the lead into the vein. And this has been associated with a markedly reduced incidence of problems with leads because you're avoiding the subclavicular crush area uh, with the lead and the those potential complications. The, co the difficult part is that it's more surgery and uh, for non-surgeons, it's a little bit more challenging to find it. That said, there are many practices where uh, dissection of the cephalic vein and direct insertion of the lead are done. If you need two leads though, it can be challenging to put two leads into the cephalic. And so sometimes people will do a cephalic vein for the more, more um, critical lead like the ventricular lead, and then maybe a subclavian stick for the atrial lead. Um, but uh, this is a commonly used approach. And then finally, uh, what you've seen me do, those of you who've been in surgery with me, is uh, I will typically use the axillary vein, which, is, which can be accessed percutaneously. Generally, the axillary vein uh, uh, crosses about near to the uh, first rib and clavicle uh, cross area there. You can see it's a little lower than average here, um, but the advantage of the axillary vein is it can be percutaneously uh, with a needle and a guide wire accessed, and you basically are getting the advantages of being extra thoracic, so you don't have to worry as much about getting a pneumothorax unless you stick the needle in too far, and you also get the benefit of avoidance of a direct uh, subclavian puncture. And so uh, I would say uh, axillary vein is probably one of the more common ways that people do it. Sometimes I'll use ultrasound. Sometimes I'll just use the angiogram and the, uh, the markers, the anatomical features in order to access. Um, but that's, these are the three uh, veins one would consider using uh, to place a pacemaker lead. All right, this is an ECG that was obtained on somebody who's 10 years following an orthotopic heart transplant. Uh, what is the rhythm? Do you have a thought on why the rhythm is the rhythm it is? And uh, do you have any thoughts on treatment or evaluation etiology? So I'm going to punt this up to the higher level fellows, and I'm going to ask Dr. Kong what she thinks about this. Hi, Dr. Pass. Okay. So this looks like a first degree heart block. I'm looking to make sure it's not changing in PR intervals. And I believe it's constant. Uh -huh. um, they do seem to be P waves that are conducted. Um, so in a transplanted patient, I worry about rejection. Mm -hmm. um, treat rejection is always the number one. Uh, in the differential diagnosis of any rhythm problem in a transplant patient. So whenever you are, wherever or whenever you're working as an attending <laughs> doctor, if you're taking care of a transplant, you're on service and you see an abnormal rhythm, you always suggest to the transplant doctor, is this possibly rejection? They hate when you say that, but it is almost always the case. But <laughs> so rejection is one possibility. Any other uh, issues? We're 10 years after heart transplant. 
Hmm. I guess we could have. This is a new finding, though, correct, Dr. Path? Uh, yes, let's say it's new. Mm -hmm. um, I, the non transplant related, like viral myocarditis, Lyme. Yeah, that's true. Any of those things can affect a transplant patient and maybe even more likely to because they're immunocompromised. But, uh, you know, in the transplant world, as you know, uh, Dr. Lamore and Dr. Glass are doing like, you know, 25 mLs of blood testing every single time they see them. <laughs> They've tested every viral disease known to mankind, every infectious disease, nothing is positive. Um, has the patient recently had a cat? And um, so uh, may I ask why you're asking this question? If it's a post-cat finding that we accidentally- yes, could be an injury from cath, an inelegant catheterizer such as myself <laughs> may have uh, bumped the AV node, that would be uh, disappointing, but uh, not unheard of, that's possible. But no, this actually, the last cath was a year ago, and there was in fact a normal, there was a normal ECG obtained during one of the uh, visits since that cath before this. I'm not sure. I don't think I know the answer that. So the only, yeah. so you actually, your answer was the best answer for sure. You get 100%, you get almost full credit for the answer of rejection. <laughs> but the other, the other possibility is coronary disease, okay? Oh, so, mm. Uh, somebody is that far out from transplant, you remember that transplant patients are always at risk for coronary vascular disease. And uh, that's the reason why every year we shoot their coronaries because we're always worried about this. Um, and uh, one could have a distal coronary problem or even more than a distal coronary problem. And the other problem of course is transplant patients generally do not have chest pain because they have a denervated heart. Now. There is some evidence to suggest that they become re enervated over time, but they certainly don't have the kinds of chest pain that we normally associate with uh, coronary insufficiency. And so, um, in this particular patient, actually, I performed a catheterization, and this patient did have quite a bit of uh, coronary vasculopathy. Um, and so uh, in this case, this was a very important finding. And on Holter had a number of episodes of Mobitz 1 and even Mobitz 2. And as a result, we ended up placing a pacemaker uh, as well as a tremendous amount of, um, of immunological therapies that uh, Dr. Lamore and uh, uh, others used, Dr. Sue used to try and improve this. It actually, unfortunately, because it was an ischemic event that caused this, there was it never improved, uh, and ultimately the patient died, unfortunately, but um, not acutely, like a couple of years later, but uh, from coronary vasculopathy and uh, did not get a heart in time. So I think with that, we're going to stop. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I hope you found this of use, and uh, I'll see you in uh, conference in just a short while. Thank you.